If I could request that only audio is used for this, I'd like to take this <laughs> opportunity to cast that vote. Are you recording now? Yeah, it should, does it show recording on your end? It does, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm down with the only audio thing, but then people can't see my Watt from Pedro looks that I got going on today. No one, no one would have any idea what I'm talking about, but I'm looking like Watt from Pedro. Or your, uh, your choice to always use vertical orientation. For <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm the only one. I'm always the only one that only uses a vertical orientation. It's my style, man. It, it, I, it, <laughs> it's your style. <laughs> it fits my uh, fits my vertical orientation in real life. So, uh, how's 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 uh, quarantine treating you all? I'm having a, a slower week this week for sure. I, this week, I think also because the weather is really bad here, it's snowy again and it's gray. I feel just a little bit less motivated this week than I have in previous weeks, to be honest. Yeah, I think that there's a there's a spectrum of, of somewhere between the two poles of like guarded optimism and and suicidal despair <laughs> just sort of ping-ponging back and forth between them yeah um and uh so i gotta say yeah and it's uh there's a lot of bread being baked yes i have a theory on that what's the theory i my theory is that that and, and I don't know how to quite put this because it's it's like sort of obviously sort of joking around on it, but like um, obviously not everyone is baking bread, right? Like nurses and and people of color dominantly. It's very much a white person thing. Um, it seems to be, but like the internet seems to be exploding with the baking of the bread. And um, I think it's because of uh, two things: bread, bread, uh, the aroma of bread being baked triggers the same kind of lobe um, brain lobe as memory that music does. So like it, it makes you remember times of, you know, calm and, and to the smell. And then I think the baking of the bread is a, has a, has a very um, structured beginning and end to it. And we're living in this time now with where there appears to be no end to this despair. So those two things together and people are like, ah, Let's bake bread constantly. I think that I think what will happen next, if I am to be predictive, is pizza. People will go. You know what else you can do with dough? Melt cheese and put tomato sauce on it. I'm already there. You heard, see what I'm saying? Right? <laughs> Flatbreads once a week. Yep. <laughs> and what is the distinction between flatbread and pizza? Uh, what it says on the packaging when you buy the dough. I think. <laughs> oh, you're buying the dough. You gotta make the dough. <laughs> I'm not making the dough either. No. It's like if, if it takes, if the prep time is longer than the time it takes to eat, that's already just a, a very short amount of patience for cooking. So yeah, I, think I don't think people so. love repetition. People love the process. You uh, don't. Not for cooking. I don't think and you've that, yet fully, fully gotten to the, the various stages of quarantine, right? And, and eventually you will reach the stage of quarantine where it's all about. The, the preparation, the eating is very secondary to it. Yeah. I mean, maybe I've got, I've got a unique quarantine cause it's, it's probably similar to you. It's work more than ever. Right. It's, yeah. it's like every yeah. week is that one hell week that you think about that happens every few months. Now it's every single week, every day, <laughs> every day. Yeah. And now it's family obligations on top of that. Cause I'm staying with my parents and it's, there's no turning off. Uh, so cooking is a turned on because you're in the kitchen surrounded by family. It's not a quiet meditative. That, that's where I go for a walk. Yeah. Right. Right. Carly, you're in a similar situation. I am, but I have the good fortune of having the house to myself for the day. And so I do a lot of cooking like late afternoon early evening before they get back because i actually find it to be a very calming thing but i had to laugh when you said that the preparation time is more i spend like two hours preparing 
go that I eat in five minutes. If I used that method, like I would have to just, I would never stop eating. I would have to have these crazy elaborate, <laughs> but for me, it's something that I'm doing a lot of. I have not baked any bread and I have bought pre-made dough for homemade pizzas. So I haven't entered the bread baking part yet, but I, I feel like I barely know either of you. <laughs> I'm you wanted diversity of opinions, right? <laughs> well, you all are battling the the, the 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 you know family or whatever. I got twenty four seven George, which is a whole lot of George twenty four seven. So so yeah, it's me me and my yeast you know, keeping me what, company. What do you do when you find downtime and you're not cooking? Do you, is there anything you go to that? Playing guitar uh, uh, is really playing guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was moments before this, I was trying to figure out Aurora Borealis by the Meat Puppets from the seminal album Meat Puppets Two. And I'm reading, I'm reading an oral history of the Meat Puppets, <laughs> which which I'm finding amazingly great. It's really horribly written, and there was no editing involved. Dude, just completely like, I'll get anyone who has ever known anything about the Meat Puppets to talk and transcribe it word for word with no editing. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I can read this forever. You gotta be a hardcore Meat Puppet fan. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I, am. <laughs> I, I am. I am. It does. It does. It does make me think that I'd like to talk about our our, our articles that we've all written. But I'm very, I'm very hung up being the egotistical person that I am on this whole job to be done thing. That the that, uh, that music, the role that music must play now, um, as it changes, and the Meat Puppets are playing a very, very, very. Good, they're they're doing a job that needs to be done for me these days. And uh, I think the the recalibration of what what music what the role of music or Carly wrote about soundscapes, all those things that play a role in our lives today. It's, it's, it's a recontextualization for sure. Well, why don't you talk about that Forbes piece? Cause I think that sets up both mine and Carly's pieces. Yeah. So, um, First, it was just good to write again. It's just, I mean, that's, that's the other thing. I mean, I'm convinced that there's, there's such an innate need for people to create, right? Like the, the, the observation that I see, and I think this goes back to the bread thing too. Like people, people when they're not, not you know, constantly scheduled, um, fill that void. I, I don't know anybody who's just like, yeah, I'm just going to sit and watch Netflix all the time. Like even my students who have their, their, their voids are pretty full with schoolwork and everything else. Like one of us, like yeah, I'm learning a language, or right? it's just like that's just it's what we do. I think that's what that's what humans do. So, um, so yeah, the, the writing thing is is really really helpful to me. But it, the the piece is just about how there's a there's a, a business discipline called job, jobs to be done that was um, kind of pioneered by Clay Christensen, who also pioneered the um, innovators dilemma, and he he asks businesses or whatever to, to recontextualize their their thought process around um the things that they put into the world not so much as oh this might appeal to this or that particular person or demographic or whatever but rather to think of it as well people hire products to serve a certain job to get that job done yeah obviously it makes sense you, you hire a shovel to dig a hole or whatever but it, but when you go a little deeper than that and particularly when you think about music um, we, we hire music for a specific job and, and in a pre COVID-19 landscape, a lot of people hired music to listen to in their commutes and listen to in their cubicles and those things are gone. Um, and, and it's why the streaming numbers have gone down. So the piece is really noticing that and then asking people to rethink about what their relationship is to music and, and how they, uh, what, what job it's, it's serving in their life right now. I think it's really different. I think it's, um, People are approaching music very differently now than they were two weeks ago. And it, it baits the question, you know, what do musicians do? I mean, that, that's the whole thrust of all this is, is I mean, I'm, I'm really fixated on how, I've always been fixated on how do, you, how do you monetize a career as a musician, which has never been easy, but now it's like, oh, let's take away 80% of your revenue. Like, you, you can't tour. So we, we've done a little better to think of some other jobs to be done. So when you talk about the meat puppets, <laughs> some job to be done with you what is that and how does what is it that you're feeling oh man that's a good one it's just happiness like i just i love their music so much and for me it's it's um 
I was a fan of them. I was, I mean, they were like my favorite band in the world when I was you know, 16, 17 years old. Um, didn't really understand much of it at all. Um, and then, then I, I only became a dead fan like five, 10 years ago or something. And now I listen to the people, it's like, oh, they're just doing the dead, you know? So like this, this real continuum, they're doing a way more kind of <laughs> different, different than the dead, but the, the through line is there. It's just the tempos, the, the psychedelic elements of it, all of it just, just works so well. And it's, it's really, really cool guitar playing. Like he's just a badass guitar player. It's not, it's not like the, the, the speediest or trickiest in the world, but it's just really unique. And, and I, I just love playing along. Cool. Are they doing? Uh, I don't even. Know, I don't know anything about the meat puppets. Right? I'll look them up after <laughs> this. But, this whole talk is about the meat puppets. Um, but I don't so, know what they're doing. I mean, I mean, they they were they've been around for thirty some years. Like the last I saw, they're still touring. They put out a new record recently. Like they do what they do. You know, I mean, it's 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 inspiring to me. I mean, they you know they had their moment when when Nirvana covered a couple other songs on the MTV Unplugged and, and brought them up on stage. Has one of my favorite moments of any musical, like, um, you know, show or whatever. Kurt's up there and he's about to, <laughs> about to play one of their songs and to tune one of Kurt's guitars off stage. It's taking so long and Kurt kind of looks up and goes, are you tuning a harp? Why is it taking so long? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the meat puppets were completely out of place there. But then, then they kind of had a hit after that. But then they, they went right back to the obscurity that they you know, kind of existed in. But, you know, they pioneered the whole... Um, they and like Black Flag pioneered that first wave of SST bands that, that to this day like kind of set the set the tone and set the way in which bands tour and and um, you know that, that kind of DIY ethos it was it was them and and, and um, you know the the, the what you call Black Flag and, and uh, D Boone and and, and uh, uh, Pedro uh, Mike Watt from uh, uh, Men, my lord, um, they were they were the ones that really kind of blazed the trail, and it's 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 really durable, you know. Um, I don't I don't know. I mean, I guess like the the closest analogy now would be like jam bands and the way that they mm -hmm. kind of like just go out, play wherever, tour on mass. But but again, no one's touring for until like twenty twenty two. Are they doing anything right now in this quarantine era that is representative of like the, the DIY ethos? What are they doing now that is, or are they kind of old? I think everybody's local? grasping for the same thing. I think everybody, nobody, nobody has this figured out. And, and um, as I said, in one of my pieces, it's like, I just, I don't see, I don't see the answers coming from any kind of incumbent, you know, whether that's a label or, or bands that have been around for a while, they're largely unaffected by this or they're, I mean, they're ever affected, but, They'll, they'll go on. Um, it, it'll be some, you know, my piece I talked about, it'll be some young artist who's also tech savvy who has nothing left to lose. And that's always where the innovation comes from. I do think that what you said, and I think, I don't know if it was in the piece or in conversations after that, one of the saddest things is that a lot of people who entered this time as artists won't emerge as artists. And I have a, you know, a good friend of mine in Berlin, she tours with bands, that's her, her whole job. And she tours with, you know, some bands that do like stadium shows of a hundred thousand people. And then she's at, you know, smaller punk rock venues and the conversations that she's having right now, no one's even discussing tour dates before, before the fall of 2021. And that's a really long time for a touring musician to think of having to supplement their income. Like she has to totally rethink her work. And I think my friends who are musicians right now, some are baking bread. A lot of them are just with their families too and just enjoying this time. I think, I don't know, like this whole idea of now is the time to learn a new language or write your first novel. I actually don't, I don't think that's always the right approach. Like certain people approach this in different ways. And I know in my piece too, it's like, I think this is a time where you can just, you don't actually have to have a huge creative output. You don't have to do anything that you look back on and feel like it was something life changing that you've, that you've created your life's work in this time. I think if you spend this whole time just reflecting or, you know, growing or just challenging yourself then that can be as valuable as you know learning Japanese or writing your first movie script so I think 
I think people are handling it differently and it is really too bad that a lot of artists just won't be able to continue that output. But I think Dan also gave some pretty interesting ideas of ways to keep that up. And I think, I mean, I am seeing more and more people trying to artists trying to engage differently or in different ways different ways to them, ways that they, things that they weren't doing before that they are doing now. I just don't know. I feel like the, the urge to create is a very human urge, but I actually think there's a huge amount of, of new stuff being created all the time. So it's also about how you kind of work through that, how you find the content that you're looking for, because I feel like there's actually more content than ever. Like you guys are saying, you're busier than ever. So I don't know. That's an interesting dichotomy happening right now. That's a good point though. Talk about your piece, because I, through your piece, I discovered content that had been up in the world forever that is making me feel a lot more comfortable right now. So, Well, I actually... in February, I went to this conference called Sonic Acts in, in um, Amsterdam. And it's a really cool conference. It's kind of more like artist based, but they do have some panels and then they have art installations and, and they kind of use um, the arts to address some of the bigger topics. And this year was climate change. And so I went to it. I'd been, I don't know, in 2017, maybe I'd been before. And it always kind of resonated with me. And there was this one researcher, this one woman, um, who I actually mentioned, Anya Kengeiser. I'm not sure if I'm saying her name correctly. Um, And her whole work is around kind of sound ecology. And she is, the project that she was talking about anyways, um, was on an island off the coast of Australia. And her whole research and work there, she just will like sit in a place and do sound recordings for months or however long. And in those stories, she talks a lot about colonialism in addition to the effects of just climate change. And she was playing these recordings of these places. And for me, that hearing her talk, I started thinking, how it is true our our environments can tell us so much more about the the state of the world that we're living in. And I, you know, at the beginning of the quarantine too, people were talking about how the birds were singing louder or you were seeing, you know, how like the environment seemed to, I don't want to say heal because that's become also like a meme in, in of itself. But our our environments are sounding and looking a little bit differently. And so the idea of sound ecology, I thought was something just really interesting. Um, And I thought also already about the sounds that we hear in hospitals. And so it was this idea of, okay, what do, what do sounds mean? How do they affect us? And maybe to my point before, if, if you use this time, reflect or think a little bit differently, I think that that can be as valuable as trying to have some, really impressive output and I started I mean I'm also at my dad's house out now this is not my normal environment it sounds very different (laughs) you know rural Ontario to my apartment in Berlin Germany it's a very different uh, kind of soundscape out here but I think you know we take sound for granted or like George said you know music for hire we have we have our kind of routines and that involves sound, whether it's the sounds around us or the sounds that we choose, be it through music or podcasts or, or streaming, whatever kind of digital content we're, we're using. And so for me, I'd been thinking a lot about that and hearing that recent talk. And so uh, thinking about sounds and how they can affect our happiness and our health there are a lot of things. There are some silver linings here, you know, like the sounds of our cities. Maybe it's nice to have a break from that, but there's also really interesting areas um, like the sonification of data in hospitals, for example. I think for me, it was a piece about kind of pausing right now, but still trying to kind of introduce interesting people or companies that explore sound in a way that goes beyond just audio or you know, like the regular audio forms that we're used to. So uh, yeah, that's kind of 
where that came from. Yeah, I mean, so much, so much there, and it, it definitely it, it inspired me when I was thinking about the, the job to be done for music in hospitals. Like, I mean, it, it just it just devastates me to, to hear these people are are dying, you know, alone. And, and one of the first things people are, are asking for is is you know, some kind of music, something. Like that. So it's it's, but um, yeah, we don't think about that. I'm loving not hearing airplanes constantly overhead. You know, I'm, I'm loving not being on an airplane, but it's, it's when I hear an airplane now, it's like, wow, what's that strange sound? And, and to your prior point about like the, the kind of like doing things um, in this quote unquote space, again, as I said about the bread thing, that's a super privileged kind of thing. And I'm, I'm deeply aware of it. Um, and same deal with like, I mean, you know, Shakespeare wrote or whatever, whoever wrote whatever and whatever mm-hmm. past quarantine. It's like, yeah, he, he wasn't or she wasn't raising kids at the same time and trying to work. Like, I mean, so many people with whom I work, they're on, on Zoom calls and also trying to be a primary caregiver and also try, it's, it's an impossibility. So, yeah, I mean, I'm making, making light of it. I do think there is still an impulse to create, but that's a luxury that, that, that some people have and a lot of people just don't at all. So I'm, I'm, I'm deeply sensitive to the idea that it's, it's, it's really glib to just say, yeah, well, use this time to learn Latin or something. No, I'm going to use this time to try to not go completely insane and, and keep the wheels on the bus of my household. Yeah. But I think it's also kind of, I mean, when we think of music, we think of what we just know as music, but there's music kind of all around us. Our environments create music and this idea of kind of personal soundtracks. And there is still a lot of beauty. There's beauty in the different sounds. There's beauty in the silence. And again, just to bring up the the hospital thing, I mean, the hospital thing is interesting in so many ways because it is just a kind of cacophony of overwhelming beeps and buzzes to the average person. But the people who work in hospitals, it's just like a, they hear a song. It, it, they hear mm. the, the language that they speak. And so this idea of the sonification of data, uh, the company um, that I reference in the piece, Man Made Music, that's kind of what they're doing. They're trying to work with hospitals and healthcare professionals to make the sounds emitted more pleasant also for the person in the room. Because if you're the person in the room and you one of the machines you're hooked up to starts going off, your initial reaction is one of panic, but it could be saying something positive, something the doctor needs to know, but it could be positive. And so I think kind of imbuing music into different parts of our life or realizing that there are really musical parts of life and working to make it maybe sound a little bit different is also a really cool area to explore as an individual, as a musician, as someone who's interested in musicology, or just someone who's worried, not not worried, someone that has to maybe spend time in hospitals right now, or is worried about spending time in hospitals. So that's interesting. Are you embracing your new soundscape that you've found yourself in, or are you manipulating it to make yourself feel more comfortable? I am embracing it for the most part because as I mentioned, it sounds very different out here than it sounds in Berlin. And I know that it would sound different if I was at my apartment in Berlin as well. It would sound very different right now. But the way that it sounds often (laughs) in my neighborhood in Berlin, um, it's a nice kind of break to, to have none of those sounds. And I think for me, the silence has been loud because I'm not used to it. When there's a lot of noise in the background, just be kind kind of like a white noise hum, but the silence can be quite deafening. But for me, I've, I've actually been embracing it. Yeah, I, I don't know if I like have developed tinnitus or tinnitus or have you said it, like ringing in the ears thing, and I, or maybe it's just quiet and like it's just a constant thing that I hadn't been noticing. But yeah, that's been, and then I thought it was, you know, the COVID that it got me and, and it was just like this perpetual ringing. And, uh, but yeah, the, the silence is, is interesting because I, I love me some ambient notes. Like I like having just a racket kind of going on. It, 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 you know, it soothes the savage breast or whatever. And like, so I'll have, you know, MSNBC or something on, which is its own particular breed of, of hellscape at times. But, um, but at least, you know, as I say, I'm just by myself. So at least it's kind of, kind of noise. And then I turn it off and the, the, the just ringing, just that the ambient kind of buzz of life or whatever is, is, is an interesting sound. Um, but Dan, you, you're, you know, I mean, you, you like, we wrote, we wrote articles and, and you wrote a book. Um, so, you know, and, and that, that's really prescriptive and like how 
how uh, how artists need to be think about navigating this. And it, I mean, you had started that before all this went down, right? Like, you, the, the... no, I, well, I had conversations um, specifically with Peter, one of our clients, um, about how there are all these tools that are available to artists that they're just not using. Live streaming being one of them, whereas people in other creative fields have embraced them, whether that's live streaming or even just YouTube, which I think is such a basic, it's such an understood media platform. Everyone understood or it. misunderstood. Everyone knows how to use it. Kind of. So like I always say this to my students. I'm always like, you all think that you're like savvy on, on the internet, but like they couldn't run a campaign or understand like a funnel to save their lives. They're sort of digital natives, you know? I mean, from a consumer point of view, yeah, yeah, everyone, sure. yeah. Yeah, yeah. everyone knows how to use consumer or everyone knows how to use YouTube for yeah. their consumption, right? Yeah. And yeah. YouTube consumption has gone through the roof right now. CPMs have gone down. So creators are getting paid less per thousand views, but they're getting so many more views that it's kind of bouncing out. and People are spending less money on YouTube. Right. Um, but it's... Think about how musicians use YouTube. They put out a music video once every two months, three months, whatever, which is the YouTube playbook is consistency, right? And putting things out um, that generate kind of a, a recurring audience base that comes back, watches your videos over and over again. And that's how, that's how this whole industry of YouTubers came up um, and artists have just failed at it because it's mm. not a traditional uh, distribution platform for them. So it's, it, it blows my mind that it makes sense that photographers are able to use YouTube really well, but you know, makeup artists and people that are just living their daily life, but they have a camera. So they call it a vlog and they're able to get hundreds of thousands of views, which turns into $10,000 a month. And why aren't artists doing that? It's such a meaningful revenue stream. You're right. And, and it's something that's infuriated me forever because like artists, artists are the worst self promoters so much of the time. And you're dead right. You look at somebody who's like, yeah, I know how to put on makeup, right? Or whatever. And, and, they, and they make some videos. And the next thing you know, like they're an influencer and, you know, and, and musicians just can't or won't or whatever do it and i mean i'd be remiss if i didn't call youtube out in terms of their absolutely um just offensive rates that they pay in terms of the stream I and mean, by far and away the, the the biggest consumption platform for music isn't spotify isn't title or any of those others it's youtube and they pay the musicians the songwriters and the performers the absolute least and it's reprehensible i mean there's just it's inexcusable and and yet once again the artist community just that ah, we're just going to kind of roll with it so i love the fact that you're you're, you're trying to monetize it or try, at least teach people to monetize it but one of the core fundamental problems is like we have to decide as a society do we do we want to have artists be paid more or i mean the the, the, the federal our, our legislators vote on what is known as, as the mechanical, the statutory mechanical royalty. So our representatives vote on it. That, that is the amount of money that a songwriter is paid when their music is reproduced and distributed. That rate, which is set by Congress, has been set since 2003 at the same rate. In 17 years, that rate has not gone up. The, the cost of life because of inflation has gone up probably in, uh, half an order of magnitude or something. And, and for, for musicians, no, nothing. And, and like, nobody talks about it. And, and YouTube's the worst offender. Is that a barrier, do you think, that artists aren't utilizing something like YouTube more? It's probably they're utilizing it, they're just not monetizing it, right? I mean, that's your whole well, thesis, Dan, right? They're not using they're not it They're not right. using it correctly, yeah, right? They're, yeah, they're correctly. putting up one video that they hope people rewatch over and over again rather than a series of videos that generates uh, a high volume of, of plays over time. Um, but that's interesting. I mean, I wonder because artists aren't using YouTube in the way I'm suggesting if they decided to, and that became a more important revenue stream, would then the music industry then try to lobby for that? It's what happened with TikTok, right? It's well, kind of, I mean, it, it, I'm sorry to interrupt, go ahead. Well, with TikTok, once it became a meaningful platform for the music industry, then now they're saying, all right, we want, we want to get paid more fairly. 
if YouTube was more than just a put your music video up, if it was actually a, a distribution platform with more regular content from artists, meaning more, uh, more revenue and it would be a lot more apparent how little YouTube is paying, um, would then the music industry lean into YouTube and put more pressure onto them? I mean, you know, I, I, my, my point of view on it is that the three major labels are making such gargantuan windfall profits, a million dollars an hour from the DSPs, that, you know, the TikTok story is an interesting one where at first, I mean, it is, it, by all legal standards, the, the, you know, the way that people are using TikTok is, is prima facie infringement. You are immediately infringing, creating derivative works. And, and no, neither the publishers or the labels could sue because TikTok at the time, Musical.ly or whatever it was, was in China. And like it's, you, can't, you can't find them to sue them. So it goes and it grows. And then the, the, what happens is, I mean, I see my, my 13-year-old son do this. He will discover something on TikTok. It's basically the only place he discovers something. Then he digs it and then he goes to, uh, goes to YouTube. Uh, I'm sorry, to, to Spotify to stream it. So it just becomes this funnel, and then a stream on Spotify represents significant revenue to the labels. So the labels are happy as little clams about people discovering things on TikTok or YouTube or whatever because they monetize it on Spotify. What I believe has happened is now t TikTok's kind of had to come to the table and say, okay, well, we want some of this. They went to the labels to get a rate. The labels said no. <laughs> you know, and, and, but they're not, it's the same thing with Spotify. They're not going to shut them down. It's, it's just, they win either way. Um, and it, who loses is the individual, individual independent artists. And I think what's so important about your book is that it is, is showing the independent artists that they, they can and should be monetizing these things. I mean, if you, if you are an artist who owns your own master recording, writes your own songs, doesn't have a label, puts it up onto Spotify and then uses TikTok, YouTube, everything else in the same way that labels do to funnel and generate streams, you can over time start to start to make, uh, you know, some kind of material money off of Spotify. But if you fractionalized it out across a billion different parties, you'll never make any. And a big part of the book is, is that average revenue per fan, right? And yeah. thinking about ARP. if, <laughs> ARP, yeah, it's uh, rolls off the tongue. Uh, so if and I, I talked about this a few times in your classes, George, you know, when I used to work at pledge music and people were still buying downloads, you could count on your fans spending $10 per release. Yeah. And that was mean forever. Now they go to stream it. Right. And that's your average revenue per fan went off a cliff unless you're touring, which you can't anymore. Right. And so now what do you do? Uh, or, and if you, put a strategy behind it and think of it as average revenue per fan, which isn't, I don't think how many artists actually think, uh, then you think, all right, if my fans want to spend more money on me, is there a way for them to do that beyond just buying a t-shirt or a general yeah, yeah. member t-shirt? Uh, and so that's where the idea of subscription revenue and places like Patreon and Gumroad yeah. become so important because for fans that do want to spend money and they're definitely out there, you're giving them an opportunity to, and there's a value exchange. Um, but if you choose not to do that, it's you're potentially leaving money on the table at a time when no one can afford to. Totally right. I mean, the, the, the kind of thousand true fans memes been around for a long time, right? Where I forget who, who first popularized it, but like dude was like, look, if you can get a thousand people to pay you, you know, eight dollars a month on whatever whether that's you know a t-shirt ticket whatever that adds up to roughly a hundred thousand dollars a year the, the the problem with that is and, and this is you know people don't understand in order to get a thousand people who are purchasing you i'd say you need to put a hundred thousand or more into the top of the funnel awareness to, to you know by the time you lose those people and that's where people people get lost is that they they think oh, i just need to get a thousand people who pay me eight dollars a month sure but to get those thousand to pay that eight, you probably need a hundred thousand or more who are aware of you and think about paying. And it's true of all the arts, right? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's not just music. Yeah, you've got to have a basically a campaign. For, I, I put the music marketing funnel uh, right in the right. book, and you have to think about each stage of that: the awareness level stage, uh, you know, passive consumer, passive fans, active fans, what I call them. Um, to convert people from each stage to the other. And if you can do that without spending money, uh, that's amazing. And that probably means you have incredible art and incredible ability to put out 
interesting content. Most people don't. So there is going to be advertising costs and things like that. Um, but I think people focus. Good. Uh, so at, at least looking at it that way, you can come up with some kind of plan and you can visualize how the, the top of funnel awareness can lead to that type of person that would actually make a purchase. Cause it's not a people discover you and they immediately decide to spend eight bucks a month. It's they go through phases and if you can control that journey, uh, you're much more likely to, to see success. Couldn't agree more. I, I just think it's, it, I think artists and, and I think, you know, so often music's a canary in the coal mine. Sadly, after this, we're going to see a lot of other industries having to, be more like this quote unquote gig economy, which of course is a, is a, is a, is a sort of artifact from uh, mm. music, the music business anyway. But um, I wish people would focus less on like refining and polishing in some lapidarian way their, their art and instead focus more on finding an audience for it, right? Like it, I mean, it, uh, it makes me nuts. It's the whole purpose, not product thing, but it's like, and it's gonna be true of chefs and cooks and visual artists and everything. You don't know. And if you sit there and think, well, I'm going to try to make music or food or visual art or photography for the masses, yeah, best of luck with that. Like, I always say to people, just find 10, 20, 30 people who feel better about themselves when they hear your work, your art, eat your food or whatever. They will tell their friends that, and, and spend more time identifying those people and less time, you know, becoming, you know, making dark side of the fucking moon. <laughs> Yeah, and it's always opportunity cost, right? I mean, if you have a limited amount of yes. hours in the day and you're spending all of it perf you know, perfecting that solo. All the time. You don't know. You don't know what you're, you know, you think you have a thesis, you have a, a, a you know, a guess. Get it out there and test it now more than ever, right? In this, this time of, of absolute, utter disruption, no one's going to give you a hard time if you try something in good faith, and I think tone is important and, and being sensitive is important, but going and trying things now, there's, there's never been a better time. You, you have, a, you have a, a world that's ready to try. I would say don't do it in a skill more quickly. Well, sure. So you have a student that's a musician and they say, all right, I've been wanting to put music out, but I, I haven't because I've been perfecting it. I want to test it. What does that look like? Yeah, but it's not just a student. I mean, we have clients that it's well, like, and, oh, and oh, I've got, I've got, a, I've got a, a, I'm not going to name specific clients or business. I've got X number of business and I've got an idea for this product. Let's, 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 you know, woodshed it into the ground and think about everything that, that might not work and all this. It's like, no, let's try something, you know? Mm -hmm. I think it's right now, especially though, it's difficult to start from nothing because you can't go out and play a show or an open mic, right? Whereas if you're, if you have an audience, you can test. If you don't have an audience, the, the venues for testing are, unless you're spending money are, are a little bit more restricted. I suppose, or there's some new way that will begin to emerge, you know, art, music, just like love and life, find a way. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's, you know, as we talked about this conversation, there's now a different type of need and a different type of approach for music. And, and the smart and savvy musician will be making their art that's true to their heart and their soul right now. And they all have friends, right? I mean, even I have like a friend, you know, so share it, share it with that friend, you know? I mean, I, I don't know. Like, like give without asking for anything in return. Yeah. But not skeuomorphically. <laughs> Do you want to talk about skeuomorphic? Obviously, because I just keep saying the word Let's skeuomorphic. What I would, what I want to talk about is the fact that I'm apparently the only one that that saw the um, the Capitol Theater put out a, like a, a, a blog post mm -hmm. about like all of the uh, the recipes from you know the people that that you play there frequently. So it's like. I don't remember any of them, except, but the only one I remember is like, because I'll be like, Cheryl Crow's margarita or something. Like, who cares, right? But um, like um, Bob Dylan, <laughs> his recipe was for sticky pudding or like toffee pudding or something. Oh, yeah, and one of, the, one of the ingredients is shredded suet, S U E T, which like, I don't know if that's like an organ or like some cow fat or something, but I can pretty much promise you. Not many people have shredded suet kicking around the house, Bob. And then his description of, of his, how he likes to enjoy his, uh, his, his pudding, 
um, uh, uh, yeah, toffee. He said, uh, yeah, whatever. He's like, well, lots of people like to put syrup on it, but I like to put, I like to pour custard on top of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who has custard kicking around? And then like, like who pours custard? Because isn't custard so like this is unfrozen ice cream? You know, with a spoon. You no, 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 no. That's that's um, you're thinking of American custard, an English custard. That's um, it's it's basically it's a it's a thick, warm icing would be the wrong word, but it's this thick, warm, not super sweet uh, thing that you pour on on cakes. I don't. Uh, is it a scotch egg? You're talking about scotch egg? <laughs> so, okay, so I'm, I'm flaunting my ignorance here, right? Like I've just, I've been consumed with baking bread apparently and the yeast has gone away. Okay, so, so, so uh, what, what is it? Uh, uh, what was the thing we were just talking about a second ago? Uh, the, the stuff he pours. Yeah, custard. Like, custard. Um, like, so that has a different, a different, there's an English Very custard. Very different, that, yeah. Uh, well, it like, might just be this American custard, which is wrong, and then there's yeah. the rest of the world's yeah. custard. Uh, I imagine Carly, <laughs> spending so much time in Europe, knows what I'm talking about, I hope. Actually, I assumed it was the, a thick custard, too. I don't know that much about English cuisine. But I will say also in that article, the one that I did think was really funny, Snoop Dogg's eight-layer dip, and it's like... <laughs> Layer dip is one of the ingredients, and then I think it's like chicken wings or something. It's just like the whole article is nonsensical. It's like none of these. Th it's like Elton John's. I, I think that's not right, actually. But Elton John's split pea soup, and you have them like Snoop Dogg's eight layer dip. And the whole thing is just nonsense. But it's wait, Snoop's thing. His eight layer dip. One of the ingredients was seven layer dip. Yes, one of the one of the ingredients in his recipe is seven. <laughs> eight layer. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it's a nine layer dip maybe he adds one or two things but it like one of the ingredients is go buy seven layer dip <laughs> i love that oh that's, that's awesome brilliant. yeah i mean it's like this time again it's this weird like this is my life right like it's this weird because i'm in front of the damn thing all the time so it's this weird bouncing back between like oh i gotta go teach for eight hours or talk to clients and you know talk about furloughs or like talk about business opportunities and then also read about bob dylan's toffee pudding like it, it, there's just no distinction and division i mean my brain is like oozing out of my ear because of this weird like usually you know when i'm not doing this like there are at least some hours during the day when i'm just in front of a classroom or on a plane or something where i'm not having the stimulus kind of overload of, of all this weird random information I like it though. I like Pilger and throw it. It delights me to know and just to, just the randomness of it all. But yeah, so it's geomorphic thinking. So yeah, I mean, I think one of the big problems is, is that, that it, you know, historically people, people go, okay, so now we have to do things online. Let's replicate it, replicate an offline experience. So if you think about the, the early internet, like, there were those jive ass websites that like were flash based. Remember before Steve Jobs killed flash and like you, you, Oh, go to a URL and you'd have to like, like open a door and then walk into the shop and there'd be like, and it was like, this is the worst experience of all time, right? Like, I, you know, in real life, I like opening doors and going to shops. Why do I have to do that on the internet? And, and so I, I fear that, that a lot during this time, a lot of artists are going to be like, well, I can't tour. So just tune in with me on my couch or whatever. And that, that you know, I mean, that, that has its charm to a certain degree, but it lacks, you know, what I, I'm increasingly kind of thinking of is like that third that, that third, Starbucks is the third space, so I don't want to call it that, but like there's a, a third dimension when you're at a live show. Like, so where if you're at some show, sure, the band's playing, but typically you're standing there with someone else and there's like that, that ambient kind of conversation you have with the person or you, you kind of nudge them when something cool is happening or you, you kind of have a side conversation. Started. And we haven't yet figured out how to do that um, online. I mean, I think the closest replication of that would be like Twitch where... You, people are watching video gamers, but the, as interesting, and to me it's not interesting at all, but to people that like video games, watching video games, as interesting as the video games is the little side scroll of people chattering back and forth. Music hasn't yet figured that out yet. It's like, oh, you just sit there passively and watch me play on my couch. Like, you really, really have to love that band to, to like that. I, would, I mean, it's not interesting to me. But it starts humor. It always starts. It's got to start with humor for thinking before it can evolve into something that is more 
I, I wish it did. Like, I mean, my, my whole mantra is like, well, why? Like, I mean, I, I wrote a piece like years ago for Forbes about like the, the failure of VR is because everyone's trying to think skeuomorphically, but I ran into this company called The Wave VR. And you're like, yes, we don't do that. We, we make you feel like you're on LSD on, on the VR, which is what everybody wants. Like, I don't want to be on stage with, you know, um, the Rolling Stones playing guitar, like, but I'd be happy to fly. You know, like that type of thing. Um, so I, I think it's a mindset. I think it's it's a it's a it's a lazy kind of mindset of, of innovation. There's there's a terrible laziness around innovation of just kind of accretion. And I wish more people would would you know view it with more of the sort of naive mind of like, well, why why do we have to keep doing it this way? I mean, the the, the school thing. Like I, I wrote a piece about how um, you know where where Berkeley was a a a a purpose with a classroom not a classroom with a purpose or a purpose with a campus, not a, you know, my whole point is like, okay, so we can't be in class anymore, but we can still have some of those magic moments, but not if we try to replicate it exactly the same way. And there's been zero innovation really in academia about how the, I mean, I, I go into my classrooms, there's still pencil sharpeners. It's like, well, when was the last time you saw somebody use, let alone sharpen a pencil? There's always one dude, right? It's always you know, like one hippie dude that like in the middle of class, like, oh, I need to go sharpen my pencil. Like, you know, but, but for the most part, the pencil sharpeners are not, not doing a lot. And, and they're all vestiges of, of a time that's really lost its, I mean, we're still doing the Socratic method. Like, that's, maybe it's time to move on. But it, it requires, requires non-innovators dilemma thinking. It requires you to think afresh. And I hope that this time and place shows people that planning, right? Planning and thinking, okay, I'm going to build on these these foundations, uh -huh. good luck with that. Like if people don't realize the ephemeral nature of life right now and that we're all just building castles on sand, they're crazy. So, so be in the moment, make something cool, find people that dig it. I mean, three weeks ago, we were all talk, talking about what show we were gonna see, what restaurant we were gonna go to. It's like, it's like somebody just, just flipped a switch and the world went upside down. It'll happen again. I'm old. I wonder if part of the reason is so many people haven't caught up to the existing tools that we have. It's such a hurdle to get to whatever is coming next, right? If you, it's, it's it, a mindset too. I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I think it's like, it's, it's, I hate it when like my students and when, when business people I work with like dismiss new as, as novel and, and like immature or something like the amount of people that poo pooed on TikTok when it first came out. And like, I don't like TikTok. I'm like, I'm not a 13 year old girl, but like I'm smart enough to know if like every 13 year old girl and guy and whatever is using it, maybe I should pay attention to it and not just dismiss it out of hand. Like that's how you get old. It's like you, you just stop being open to things. And it, it's, I, I don't, I, I refuse to believe that there isn't some new and interesting technology way of doing things that is at our finger fingertips at any moment. I just like the moment I feel that, like I just I don't know what the point is. Just bored out of my mind. Though I think it's as important to recognize which platforms do work for you and which maybe won't serve you. Just because there is something new, it doesn't mean that it should be utilized by every brand or artist or individual. Super smart. I couldn't agree more. I just don't, I just don't know. Like I'm not, I, I want to go into it with not a dismissive attribute, but rather one of curiosity yeah, and open mindedness and go, because I'm, you don't know, you know? And, and so like, why not at least get some kind of fluency with it and test it? And you're dead right. Like, I mean, everyone that, that put all their brand equity behind MySpace or Snapchat or something is, is regretting it, you know? And, you know, everyone's been caught with their pants down on TikTok. Well, it's like everyone bought into Facebook ads and poured a bunch of money in there. And then, you know, it's like the actual value of that is determined by Facebook. They tell you how successful your ads were. So I think, I, I think you're right. If there is something new, you can explore it and test it. But I don't think that every institution or business or individual not utilizing the newest, shiniest thing is necessarily a bad thing. Totally agree. I mean, we tell our clients all the time, it's like, yeah, no, you do not need X and Y account. Like, you, you know, it, but it, it, but there's also benefits that like you can, and I think this is true for artists and everyone else, entrepreneurs, 
like if you're early on with a platform, you can get disproportionate benefit from it, right? Like, you know, it's really hard now to gain followers on Twitter or something, right? Like it's just that, the, you know, unless you really just sort of pop in some other way, the gradual sort of accumulation of followers is plateaus. Whereas five, 10 years ago when it was starting, just, just the fact that there were less people on it, you could, you could grab, grab kind of market share that way. So I think, you know, you're dead right. I mean, they're, they're, you've got to be discriminated about it, but I, I just don't, I, I don't know. My, my weird kind of optimism is, is that there is a, a, a interesting and new every day, you know? Well, I think one of the things that I really like about your book, Dan, and the advice in there is that, of course, it's super applicable to where we are now. But, you know, as to everything that George is saying, too, I mean, yeah, okay, we're in this situation now, but this, it will change what the outcome of all of this will be. I don't think anyone has any clarity on that. But a lot of the things that you are kind of really laying out in a clear way can be continued and built upon no matter what the situation is. It doesn't require a quarantine. It doesn't require us to all be locked down. This is a, it is a good time, as George said, to just try something new with kind of no, no ego, no fear of failure. It's just why not try it? But I do think there's a lot of longevity in a lot of the things that have you've suggested. And I think there will be a lot of longevity in just the changes we've made it as, as a society during this time. I think that there will be very lasting effects from this that are carried over to, I don't know, because a lot of things are being reevaluated. I think it will, it will be interesting to see what sticks, but a lot of these things, a lot of these new ways of working, or we've shown ourselves how effective these new ways of working can be and have always been. It's just a matter of embracing them. I totally agree. I mean, I tell my students, it's like, you know, yeah, it sucks that, that, you know, we're not in the classroom, but I'm forcing them all to use Slack. And it's like, that, that's going to help, right? I mean, because you're going to go out in the workspace. And like, I know with us, like if somebody wants to work with us right now, intern or whatever, it, you know, and they come to me and they don't know how to use Slack or Trill, I don't have time to teach them. Like, like I, you know, so being a distributed workforce or whatever, like we've had to learn these tools. And, and so it's, it's very fluid and familiar for us fluent but um a lot of students don't they get they get you know and then they get out there into the, the, the workforce and they're like, oh, i don't know how to use any of this um but uh yeah i i i do think um i want to talk about um just like some of the crap that's been like keeping keeping my brain on straight through this like the books and the movies and videos and stuff um and, but i'm curious about what what it has for you all i was asking people this and i'm like, frequently disappointed in what i get back so i'm, I'm a lot riding on what you all tell me no pressure so what is the actual question well it's all it's all just a selfish way for me to be able to like talk about the shit that i love but uh, i want to hear what you what you all like to like music books tv whatever that's keeping you sane through this ish I mean, aside from eight layer dip, <laughs> nine layer dip, man, it's nine chicken. layer dip, buy <laughs> seven layer dip, add chicken wings, and then some other layer. Like every time we talk about it, it's going to add another layer. Uh, it's fourteen layer dip, yeah. Yeah, two two seven layers dip on top of each other. Yeah. Uh, I got two things that are keeping me really sane right now. Neither of which is super interesting. I discovered yerba mate, like right eight uh, months ago, because I don't drink coffee, but right. I need caffeine. Right. Um, and black tea will only get you so far. Uh, so that keeps me sick because <laughs> better than like a monster or a Red Bull, uh, which is the alternative. Uh, but I've been to kind of go back to soundscapes. I've been watching on YouTube uh, walking tour videos of my favorite cities, especially because now I'm in rural Pennsylvania and I'm used to uh, my apartment in, in Brooklyn, which is right off of Main Street or, or the office that I rent, which has 300 people in it, uh, I'm used to kind of this vibrant atmosphere. Uh, and obviously, I miss all my favorite cities. So, so you have a big TV behind me. There are four hour long, 4K, 60 FPS walking tours. I can go from Barclays Center in Brooklyn to Madison Square Garden from my couch 
And sometimes I just put that on in the background and it's just like there's an activity going on because there is no activity in Regalsville, Pennsylvania. Regalsville. Uh, uh-huh. So that's what I enjoy. And the new book on uh, Instagram just came out, No Filter. Uh, about the, oh, is it like, uh, is it like a... a- is it a book about the founding of Instagram and stuff? Power yes. Like what was the what was the one that what's Nick Dalton wrote about hatching, hatching Twitter? Twitter. That's a great book. That's a great book. I love that so much that you're going on walking tours. I I think that that's actually just so great. It's it's a whole niche on YouTube, and I found ones the, the obvious ones like New York, London, Boston, all the cities I spent a lot of time in. But I found one, one of my favorite towns in the world is this kind of small town an hour outside of London called Guildford. There's a walking tour of Guildford, England. <laughs> Just going down the main street, there's a small castle there. Small castle. Small castle. 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 Castle-like. <laughs> Castlelet, yeah. Uh, what about you, Carly? Well, I mean, as I've already mentioned, I'm doing a lot of cooking. I find that that just really soothes me. And I can spend like five hours cooking and preparing things and it never feels like time wasted for whatever reason. It always feels productive. It, it's like a, I don't know, a restorative act for me. And I also, it's not necessarily something that's different, but I, um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I'm just like, plowing through all kinds of new podcasts, re-listening to old podcasts. I don't know. It it does make me, it doesn't make me feel bad because I don't feel guilty about it, but it is kind of strange. I actually am not listening to that much music right now as to our conversation earlier. I don't know why. I think maybe it's just the lack of interaction, hearing people interact. A lot of the podcasts that I listen to are kind of more like interview style one. So uh, like NPR's Fresh Air, I really like, or um, um, My Favorite Murder, which is also just like two people discussing things. So I find that it's like the podcasts that I'm more drawn to are kind of conversation based. Maybe it's because I am just not having that many right now, but I think uh, those two things, and I don't know, I kind of went through a little bit of a I think when everyone was on lockdown, everybody wanted to kind of touch base and communicate. And I got a little bit burnt out from even just the requests of like, let's video chat, let's FaceTime to then feeling like I need a little bit of connection with people, kind of connecting with friends that I don't see or that are far away, especially ones with kids to kind of like connect with them has been really nice and not something that I normally would have time for. Plus the six hour time difference that I normally find myself in. Uh, it's been easier to kind of reconnect with people that I maybe have lost touch with a little bit. But so yeah, those, I think those few things are, be, are kind of keeping me somewhat sane during all of this. What about you, George? Now that we've given disappointing answers, what? Uh-huh. Have- Hey, I must say there's probably a walking tour of Marblehead somewhere. I, I mean, if not, I'll just film one. If for not, you. make one. Yeah, yeah, I'll just make one. Let's strap a let's strap a camera to my new hat. Um, <laughs> um, no, so I don't know how to pronounce this band's name. I've looked it up. I've ha- I've heard it said, and I cannot remember it to save my life. And I blame them because it's gonna be a a, a blockage for them. But it's Krongbin or something like that. K H R A U N G B I N. I believe unbelievable i love everything about them right it's largely instrumental it's got that badass kind of ethiopian um je- uh, guitar thing going. i don't know like i figured that out like there's that that's saharan african guitar sound which makes me crazy Stephen malcolm's new record has that sound on it too i think it's, it's going to be the new thing um but in and they do like the, the woman plays uh, like a dub bass kind of thing and the dude plays um trap drums it's just unbelievable i find it to be perfect and they do they do playlists on spotify too so like they'll just curate their own things that they're interested in. it's unbelievably great love that um i've already mentioned the meat puppets book that that i'm deeply obsessed with and then my third thing um pour over coffee that's my new jam and i'm becoming an expert at pour over coffee and dan i know you don't drink coffee but i bet you if i made you pour over coffee you'd be like hmm, maybe i should reconsider this but there's a whole whole science to this pour over coffee thing and i'm deep down the rabbit hole on it i'm looking at books to buy i'm certain i'm watching youtube videos on it becoming becoming quite adept at pour over coffee (laughs) 
keeps things exciting, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm I'm not mad about my yerba mate, but um, why don't like you care about it a lot? Huh? I do. Why don't you drink coffee? Have you just never? You don't like the taste or it affects it too much? <laughs> um. Yeah, I guess I've never actually drank coffee, but I've had coffee flavored things, and all of them have turned me off. And there's um, there's a a, a a candy in England called Revels. I don't know if you ever had those. Is, they, it, is it full of pudding? Custard. No, it's not full of pudding <laughs> or custard. They're all they're they're all little is it a scotch <laughs> egg. <laughs> you and scotch eggs, man. <laughs> I find them Which fantastic. Are fantastic with a bit of Branson pickle. Yeah. Um, oh yes, of course. But. It's they're all it's it's this little pouch of it looks like chocolate malt balls, but each ball is slightly different in shape and has a different filling. So as a kid, I would love to get these because like caramel or it's a malt ball, but there'd be one coffee one in there and just immediately wow. it's just like recoil. Uh, like that Harry Potter thing, the one the one candy that tastes like you know, vomit or whatever. Yeah, vomit coffee, same thing. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just in every time. Uh, coffee flavored things don't taste like real coffee taste. They don't. They don't. It's a bad representation of it. It's it like, but you know that any <laughs> like any like those little banana candies. You know the ones I'm talking about, like in the rents. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The ones that taste exactly like bananas. <laughs> no banana tastes like like no cherry flavored thing tastes like cherries. Never. So <laughs> see, it's skeuomorphism. But it's, it's super interesting that you've never had coffee, but but I, yeah, I mean, I get your. Point I didn't drink that. until law school, and and like, and I went to law school really late, so I was like thirty five. I went to law school, and and uh, I just drank it purely for like the the blast of caffeine, and then over the there years, I developed right? a taste. That's the job to be done, right? That's and the I've job to be done. But now it's kind found. of right. That's good. So in law school, the job to be done was like, yes, I'm going to mainline coffee into me so I can make it through, you know, property law or whatever nonsense. Now I'm like, oh, the job to be done is it's like my little morning ritual that I look forward to. And so it's, it, yeah, job to be done. Well, well played. <laughs> I have to go skateboarding. <laughs> Good. Well, this was fun. Let's, uh, was great. we'll do it again. Yeah, let's download this and see what it's tomorrow. Like. <laughs> Every day, yeah, Do a daily podcast, right off the bat. <laughs> All right, good to see you.